This presentation honors the brothers of the Congregation of Holy Cross. Founded nearly 200 years ago in Le Mans, France, in response to the ravages of the French Revolution. The Congregation of Holy Cross carries on today across the world, on five continents and in 16 countries. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. This is the testimonial of one brother, Gerald Mueller, who at the age of 85 has taught and inspired students around the United States in five Holy Cross high schools spanning a career of 27 years and for the past 34 years has served as professor of music at St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas. Brother Gerald, just exactly what is the Brother of Holy Cross? The Holy Cross Brother is a layman just like you, only we consecrate ourselves to God with three vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience. We live a community of life like a family, and we teach school, university level, elementary school level. Our, our charism is education and the Catholic faith. And where and why did the Brothers of Holy Cross begin and what's, what's their purpose? The whole thing started after the French Revolution. We are a French community. All right, the French Revolution begins in 1789 it ends 10 years later in 1799 with the bloodbath called the Reign of Terror, start of Robespierre. Robespierre is guillotined. By the way, the man who invented the guillotine died on it. So be careful of what you invent. <laughs> All right, moving right along. The, the French Revolution was a total mess politically. Unfortunately, the Catholic Church, official Catholic Church, got on the wrong side. The, the cardinals and the bishops were on the side of the wealthy and the rich and the, the aristocrats and the king. When the king falls and the aristocrats fall, the uh, officials fall, and then they take along a lot of religious. Whole convents of nuns were dragged out of their convents and guillotined. There's a famous opera, by the way, called the Carmelite, the Dialogue of the Carmelites. They took, this is a true fact, they took this entire convent of nuns, discalced Carmelites, put them on the guillotine, one by one they are killed. One of them had fled because she didn't want to die, die a martyr. And as each of her sisters are destroyed, you hear the slash of the uh, knife and the head bobbing off. And at the very end, there's no one to left singing the hymn to Mary. And this woman climbs the steps and offers herself to God as a martyr. Very moving. And that, at that point, the music stops in the opera. It's by Puleg. Okay. So you have this big, messy revolution. Out of that revolution comes a priest. He, when he's only 15 years old, his name is Jacques de Jarrier. He's a seminarian. The seminary is closed in, uh, in western, northwest France, where he's born and raised. He's 15 years old, the seminary is closed, he has to go home to where he belongs, on a farm in northwest France. His name is Dujarier. He then studies the rest of his seminary life with a priest. They have to hide out, they, they hide in barns, they live with private families, and he is secretly ordained a priest in Paris by a bishop. If the, the government found him, he would have been guillotined with the bishop that ordained him because the churches had been closed, the schools had been closed, there was an entire generation of little kids running around completely illiterate. So the foundation of the Holy Cross starts with Father Dujari. The revolution ends. Twenty years later, he starts the Brothers of St. Joseph. In the meantime, he had founded a, a sisterhood 
the Sisters of Providence, and they're still around. In fact, they're up in Indiana. And they were created to educate girls, young girls. Well, he finds that very successful, and then he decides he will gather a small group of young men, starting with uh, Brother Andre. He will give them a cassock, a, a habit, and then he will educate them as best he can, and he will have them go out to the villages two by two, and they will educate young boys. That's their point. They are to educate orphans, poor people in the trades, and uh, so they could make a living, as well as teach them reading, writing, arithmetic, and religion. That was always important. All right. He's old, and he's sick. He's got gout. He's suffering all the time. And so, he turn, in, a, in a tearful ceremony, he turns the brothers over to Father Moreau, and he forms the Congregation of Holy Cross. He takes the brothers of, of St. Joseph, he combines them with a group of priests that have been out giving missions, called brother, or priests of Holy Cross, and he joins them together in the Congregation of Holy Cross. Later on, he adds a, on a third group of sisters, so he's got the Holy Family now. He's got St. Joseph represented by the brothers. He's got the sisters representing Mary, the mother of Jesus, and he's got the, the priests representing Jesus. There's your holy family. Okay. The sisters and the priests and the brothers are all educators. But, okay, now I have to tell you the difference between a brother, which I am, and a cleric or a priest, which the priests are. Okay. Priests are ordained by a bishop to say Mass, to consecrate bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, to forgive sins in the name of Jesus, and to preach the good news of the kingdom. Okay. We are educators. We don't say Mass, we don't forgive sins, and we don't preach the gospel other than by our example and by what we teach in theology classes. That's the difference. We are lay people. Most people don't understand that. Okay. So this, this community becomes very successful and they, they spread all over the world. We're on five continents and in many different countries. We, we take up the culture of each of these countries that we're in, and to this day we are flourishing. In the 1840s, Moro sends his best priest and seven brothers to Indiana. Now the, this is the frontier of the United States. This is the 1840s. No railroads, they come down the Erie Canal, they end up in Vincennes, Indiana. They go north in the snow with oxen and, uh, and covered wagons to form Notre Dame University. This is 1842. That's highly successful. It's the best Catholic university in the United States, other than St. Edward's, which I will speak about. Because of the success of Notre Dame, Father Soren gets a farm in Austin, Texas from Mary Doyle. She turns 496 acres over to Father Soren and says, build me a school, a Catholic school, on my property, and the property is yours. Okay? Soren, of course, is a great zealous person, and he said, I take it. I'll take it, Mary, and I'm going to send brothers and priests down there, and they're going to form St. Edward's University. And they do. 1885, the wonderful St. Edward's University begins with three farm boys in the farmhouse, the, the white frame, frame house of Mary Doyle. To this day, where I teach for the last 34 years, it is considered one of the best private small school universities in the United States and has been so named nine years in a row by Princeton Review and U.S. News and World Report. You can't get better than that. You sure can. Brother Gerald, how does one become a brother of the Holy Cross? You have to be accepted by the community. You have to be a healthy male, Catholic, and you have to be accepted by the superiors of the Congregation of Holy Cross. There are three steps. Once accepted, and you have to be healthy and faith-filled, and you have to be willing to obey, I learned that at an early age, <laughs> you become a candidate. That can stretch from six months to a year, where you enter the community, you live in a community house, 
You do your own cooking, you learn how to live with other people, and you learn to practice the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. When, it's, when you are accepted then into the community, you go to the next step, but you have to be approved. You have to prove that you are serious about your vocation and that you feel called by God to follow this life. And I want to tell you, it is not easy. You're looking at one that's been added for 66 years and still finds it difficult. Okay. Second step, the novitiate. We go to a very special place. It, it happens to be in Colorado today. Uh, and it's uh, intense spiritual training. You are totally separated from the world. Live in silence, meditation, prayer, learn the vows, learn the constitutions. I live by this, we all live by this, and uh, after a year of this intense training and scripture reading and the rest of it, retreat, we are allowed, we are permitted to take vows. But there again, the superiors vote. We are voted on on our character, and some of us are expelled. Uh, I went through several, you know, uh, dear friends who were said, you're not able to, to live this life, get out, you know. That is coming. Is there an age restriction? No. We, we would hope the young people come, but uh, I think the cutoff is around 50. Okay. You know, we would like fruitful years out of these people once we've trained them. After the novitiate uh, and you are permitted to take your temporary vows, that would be the first step, and, and those can go from one year to three, after which you would take perpetual vows, and they are forever in mm -hmm. the year. I'm sure that the, the information that a young candidate might seek is on the, online? Yes. On, on the web? Yes. Congregationofholycross.com. Yes. And it's that, all there. It, it, it outlines what, uh, what the process Correct. is and what is required. And, and so after on. the vows, then you go, to, if you haven't had a, a college education, then you go to the university. Mm -hmm. Okay. And after that, once you are graduated and, and majored in something, I have to major in music, but I had to teach English and theology and Latin, which I hated and didn't know much of, and yet was stuck on one occasion teaching a future cardinal, a future archbishop, and a future bishop. <laughs> and, and the future cardinal, Bill Levada, used to accuse me of being only one page ahead of him in the fourth year Latin. Well, you got that right, Bill. Guess where he is today? Rome. <laughs> is a new candidate able to mark his course of discipline? Can he choose to be in, in something other than education or is it always education? No, our charism is education, but we've diversified. We have doctors now. We have a lawyer that was educated in Harvard, working in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. We have doctors. Uh, we have, it, it, it's where the need of the church is. Where, where are we needed? That's where we go. We go to the foreign missions. We took over Bengal uh, 200 years ago, practically, because no other religious community would, would take over that Muslim country, knowing there would be very few conversions, mm -hmm. but they wanted a splendid education. I want to say the Brothers of Holy Cross are probably the best educated brothers in the world. We are crawling with PhDs, and I have a master's degree, and I was told when I went to St. Edward's, you really need a, a PhD. And I said, well, I, I, I don't think I need it. I mean, I'm going to be a choral director and, uh, and I'll teach uh, all, you know, basic stuff. So I didn't go on to, uh, but I have a master's degree in, in music education. Most of our people are uh, doctors. I think something that a lot of people aren't aware of is that the uh, congregation of the Brothers of Holy Cross own St. Edward's University as well as Notre Dame. Correct. Most people do not know that, nor do they know that as a brother I own nothing. When I die, I don't even own the clothes I wear. I drive a very nice car, I'm very active, I teach at St. Edward's full-time, or half-time now. Um, I own nothing, uh, I, I live a, a celibate life, and I obey my superiors. But we live in a community, and the community makes decisions, but we also have a, a director and a superior. And when he says, we do this, we do it.
It's a, it's a hard life. You know, it's a lonely life. And it's a beautiful life. It's my fire insurance. My <laughs> fi I joined Holy Cross to avoid the fires of you know where. Yes. As well as purgatory. I'm working off my purgatory right now. I don't want to be stuck there <laughs> too long after death which is slowly approaching, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> well, you told me 10 years from now you'd still be in the classroom, so I'm not buying that. I will not only be in the classroom, but I will be rocking with a rock band. I now am the keyboardist for Brother Mueller and his brothers. Five rugby players, big hunks, 21 years old, and an 85-year-old withered-up old keyboard player. <laughs> and they asked me one time, don't you feel out of place with us? These big hunks, you know, they're pushing people around and the rugby and I said, no, we play good music. What are you doing? Marvelous life. <laughs> Brother Gerald, after becoming a brother of Holy Cross, what was your first teaching assignment? I was sent from Notre Dame, Indiana to Long Beach, California to St. Anthony's High School. I taught Latin, English, a religion, and band. I started the band there, and that's where I met and educated or helped educate with the team of brothers, only brothers in the school, running the school, owned and operated by Monsignor Dolan. I had three outstanding students. One was Bill Leveda, one was George Niederauer, and one was Jerry Wilkerson. They were brilliant, wonderful students. They were all in the band at the same time. Bill played clarinet, George played trombone, and Jerry played clarinet. Bill went on to become a priest and a cardinal. George went on to become the Archbishop of San Francisco and Jerry Wilkerson went on to be Auxiliary Bishop of Los Angeles. Okay. Outstanding students. Um, who was Brother Dunstan? Brother Dunstan was my mentor. Had he not been there and helped me through the first year of school, where, where my classes were pretty chaotic, let me tell you, uh, I would have left the, <laughs> the teaching profession and possibly the brothers. He saved me. He, he was a playwright and a wonderful teacher, and a, a brilliant, wonderful, wonderful man, and actor, of course. Where did you go after Long Beach, California? I was sent by obedience from my superiors to New Orleans, Louisiana, to what was called the Holy Cross School. I stayed there for eight and a half years, again, teaching the same subjects, uh, and band. I had a very fine band. And there, of course, I, I continued writing. I started writing books for children when I was in Long Beach, and over a period of 25 years I produced 100 manuscripts, which went all over the speaking world. They sold for two dollars apiece. The press was started by Brother uh, Ernest Ryan up at Notre Dame, and while the Catholic schools in this country flourished, our press flourished. We, one time we had three brothers on the road selling these books for two dollars apiece. I wrote 100 manuscripts. Ernest wrote over 350. We had our own press, and these were books for children that were lives of saints and heroes. Okay. And this was all while you were teaching music at, at, at Holy Cross? Correct. Right. But the, the book I'm most proud of now, as while I'm teaching in New Orleans, is Our Lady Comes to New Orleans. It's a miraculous statue of Mary. It's in the Ursuline Convent. I went through all the files that they had on the Battle of New Orleans of, 19, of 1815, and wrote this book, which is now online. Fourteen of my books are online under my name, faculty and the rest of it. And the school in New Orleans was also run by a team of brothers, am correct. I correct? Correct. So this whole thing has been a team effort since, since day From one. the beginning. Right. The brothers handled the entire administration and also the teaching. I'm sent there then out of the middle of a school term to uh, Sherman Oaks, California, because Brother Eugenio, the band director, was moved to Rome to work at our general aid. And so I go to California in the middle of the year, which is the worst time for a teacher to be transferred. The, the students know, know themselves and how to manipulate the school <laughs> system, but the newcomer is totally blind. You're flying blind. 
so I am sent to this, to this school. Don't want to be there, but it's obedience, so you obey when you, when you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm in New Orleans the last night, and I'm, I'm packing thousands of dollars of beautiful, brand new instruments that I will never use. And I'm sent off to this <laughs> Hollywood. <laughs> How did you acquire the instruments and uniforms at the various schools? We had different band clubs and they would put on fundraisers and that's how we paid our just, bills. Just in like New Orleans, know. we made big money because we marched in 10 mile parades. We had little kids in, in junior high that were marching 10 miles without a break playing way down yonder in New Orleans <laughs> with thousands of people throwing stuff at it, including the doubloons from the, from the uh, floats going by. Now, after leaving New Orleans <laughs> and arriving in Sherman Oaks, California, I, I believe that Sherman Oaks is where you had um, many uh, children of major movie stars. Yes, I had school. Mark Harmon, the popular TV star today. He was a in junior. He was a junior, I think, sophomore or junior. He was the quarterback of the uh, football team, and his father, of course, was the Heisman Trophy winner. I had uh, Billy Cat, who went on to Broadway. I had Jerry Mathers, the Beaver. I had uh, Ed Begley Jr., whom I'm still in contact with. And uh, all these people were in the band or in, in my classes. And again, I'm, I'm with a team of brothers teaching religion, English, Latin, and band. And of course, the, the rest is history. So the, the Brothers of Holy Cross really opened the doors of your life, all of your life, yes. since, since you became a brother. Both as a writer and as a musician and as a teacher. And after Sherman Oaks, you took a year off. Yes, that was when I went to, I was allowed to go to uh, Austin, Texas. I was given a year off to research the life and uh, work of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. The night that Martin Luther King was martyred, I stood up and made a vow. I said, I will write his life. I did not have an agent. Uh, this is out of the blue sky and God's grace. I didn't have an agent. I went ahead and I got the permission of my superiors to travel for three months. And then for nine months, I had every book, every article, every interview of, of his life. I had also the, the privilege of spending an entire morning with his parents in Atlanta, and, and they refused to see uh, the man who wrote The Day Christ Died, and, <laughs> but they saw me after persistent phone calls, when the mother finally said, get in the cab, come on over here, we'll see you all morning. So we had breakfast and they told me things they would not tell Jim Bishop, the famous writer. Here I am, this nobody, with no contract, no agent, nothing but, but the will of God and, and the grace of God. Relate the story about uh, Martin Luther King Sr. likening you to someone that had helped him early in his ministry. Well, we're going to the door and he said, as we're leaving, as I'm leaving the door, he said, you look just like the man who gave me my first pair of glasses that I couldn't afford. And when I finally got enough money from my three Baptist congregations to pay for the, for the examination and the glasses, he sent the $35 back and he said, someday you will be an important member of this group that will solve the civil rights program and, and allow American citizens the right to vote and eat in restaurants and uh, take rooms in hotels and all the rest of it. And once again, the, uh, the doors were opened as a Holy Cross brother. Correct. Only because of that. Correct. Then I go back to teaching in San Antonio. And that, that's when I come in contact with opera. I, I am the first brother to join the Master Singers in San Antonio. I teach in the school for six years. I have the band. Uh, and then it, on, the, on the side, we, uh, we rehearse every week, and for five years in a row, I'm able to sing opera with Beverly Sills and Richard Tucker and uh, Norman Tragel and all the, all the stars. They would bring in stars to be the, the top, you know, the, the, the name. Yeah. yeah, and then we were in the chorus, and we were the official chorale of the San Antonio Symphony. 
and I had the privilege one year of being president of the Master Singers, conducted by Roger Malone, wonderful, wonderful man. And my last teaching career in high school was in Biloxi, and I, stayed, I spent there three years there as band director. And there we had the privilege of going to Jackson on one occasion and marching in the parade that inaugurated the new governor. And we had special uh, uniforms for that occasion. The governor was elected on some kind of a program where he, had a, uh, he brought his own lunch to all these political rallies, and the lunchbox was red. <laughs> and so uh, we had little red boxes <laughs> tied around the kids, and we were playing our horn and playing his favorite song and, and marching on television for, for the inaugural parade. And we were the hit of the parade. <laughs> now, you said that was your last teaching year, but that's your high school career. Yes. Um, from there, you went on to St. Edwards University, yes. where you are even today. Correct. In 1978, I, I, I leave. Uh, by the way, while I'm in, in Biloxi, I am organist at Keesler Air Force Base, and I played services, three masses every weekend at Keesler Air Force Base. And I, I, was, uh, I was having some problems. I was getting tired of teaching high school. And so the chaplain, on one occasion, in Keesler Air Force Base said, uh, why don't you try to teach on the college level? You have a degree. And you have a master's degree, so why are, why are you spending your time in high school when it's becoming kind of boring? I mean, it's kind of showing the same movie over. Why don't you go on to a higher, higher plan? And I, I took his advice and uh, applied for a job, at, uh, which was then open and available at St. Edward's, and I've been there ever since. Along the way, you personally have had a lot of help, and I know the, the Brothers of Holy Cross have had a lot of help from some very well-known famous people, one of which was Vicki Carr. Yes, in San Antonio, our school was in the poorest neighborhood, one of the poorest neighborhoods, and uh, completely Hispanic, and we were in very dire financial need. And one of the brothers, Brother William Dueling, uh, went to Vicki Carr and asked her to do a series of concerts to benefit our school. She has always been interested in, in education. She gives m multitudes of uh, scholarships, even today, and she's still performing very well with Mariachi. Um, she came and, and on nine occasions gave these massive concerts for thousands of people and gave us a, overall a quarter of a million dollars and literally saved that school. The school is flourishing now. It changed the whole west side of San Antonio. Most people don't know that. <laughs> because of the brothers' presence there, in the poorest, one of the poorest neighborhoods, they brought in sewers, they brought in uh, drainage from uh, heavy rains, they brought in overhead lighting on the streets, they widened the streets, it, it, it improved the, the life conditions of all the people living in, in San Antonio. And Vicki Carr is one of our angels. Helped us. You've also had assistance in, in productions at uh, St. Edward's University from Ed Bagley, Jr. Correct. He is not only an actor, but he is a playwright. And he did a, a musical play on the life of Cesar Chavez came to our school, came to, to St. Edward's, and produced it for us, and uh, it, it was very successful. And then he, he has produced it in other universities. From the very beginning, Holy Cross has been officially designated helpers of the poor. We go to the orphans and the widows and the poor people that nobody else will serve or, or help or educate, and always the mind and the heart. That's moral. Morrow. Father Morrow, our founder, one of the that. founders, because he was two hundred years ahead of his time. He's the one that increased. He had insisted that music be taught, science be taught, evolution be taught, and uh, another story. In our in our mission in Brazil, there's a marching band on the Amazon River, the only marching band in the center of the the biggest country in South America. And it's owned and operated by the Brothers of Holy Cross in Santa Reng. Big marching band, can you imagine? On the, on the banks of the Amazon River. 
<laughs> the doors that have opened because of Holy Cross brothers. Yes. God bless us. <laughs> Brother Joe, tell us about your career, uh, your ongoing career at St. Edwards University. I was employed, I was hired by Brother Stephen Walsh, who was then the president of St. Edwards in 1978. And well, I have to tell you, Stephen Walsh, as a freshman in St. Anthony's High School, was in my band and played third, third chair trumpet. And he, he never forgot that as he became president. But he had the good fortune of hiring his former band director. And then he was followed by Patricia Hayes, a magnificent leader. And today we have Dr. George Martin, who is, has this world vision of where St. Edward's is going and just got back from Japan and uh, South Korea so we would have contacts and, and allow our students to study abroad. We are already back in France where we started. We're in Spain and Scotland and uh, many, a country, uh, Germany, in fact. So we are we literally worldwide. But uh, the, the essence of St. Edward's is it's a liberal arts college, uh, 5,500 students. Um, because it's liberal arts, we, we prepare pre-med, uh, pre-law, and then the other departments are uh, full majors, you can get. I came in as a teacher of music, and I was a, a department of one. <laughs> Thirty-four years later, we are a department of 14, two of which are doctors, PhDs. And I'm, I'm now half-time teaching the history of music, from 7000 BC to hip-hop today. But in the old days, when I first got there, I, I was fresh from high school teaching, and I thought that you taught a different class each period, which we, was customary in high school. Well, on the college level, the, the amount that you teach is about 12 hours per semester. <laughs> I started out with 24 hours of credit. I taught a different thing every, every period, including beginning voice, intermediate voice, piano, beginning piano, had a, two choirs, and then in the evenings I would teach uh, methods for elementary school teachers, how to teach music in the elementary school. So it, it was five days a week teaching 24 hours of credit, which is a double load, <laughs> and, and taking care of all the religious exercises, etc. But I have to say that uh, St. Edward's is a superb school and uh, it's, it teaches critical thinking and ethical and moral behavior and decision-making. And uh, it's, it's famous because of its theater. And in fact, Brother Dunstan and uh, Ed Mangum are the founders of uh, SCU Theater. And our students, if they have enough hours on stage with professional uh, actors and actresses who come in, uh, they can join the union immediately after graduation, which is wonderful. Well, I think there are only three universities that offer a program like that. And we bring in people, stars, like Ed Begley would come and, and act, or put on a play. But we, it's, it's all, uh, we have directors, we have set designers, and the, and the advantage of the theater program is those students learn everything from uh, set design, co uh, costume design, and actually making them, and, and then running the box office. They know the whole business. When they get out of there, they have a very well-rounded education in theater. And, and we're very proud of that. And of course, we're nationally known. Um, there's a big, <coughs> excuse me, a big MBA program, Master of uh, Business Administration. And those, those graduates get jobs right away in industry. We have a program of internships, <coughs> which allow the uh, the students to actually work in particular businesses and then luckily after graduation they are hired by a number of these companies and of course Austin now is a thriving center of uh, the computer industry. It's taking the place of the Silicon Valley and of course the city is growing and, and St. Edwards is growing and, and, uh, and excellence as well as numbers. Then we have a thing called the CAMP program, and that's the College Assistance Program for the Children of Migrant Workers. We take these, these 35 people 
They have to be qualified. They have to be from the farms. They're a migrant. They're, they're, we're taking them out of the fields, putting them in classes. They become doctors and lawyers and, and go back and work with the poor and their own, uh, in their own uh, localities. And that's been going over 33 years. It's in the capable hands of Esther Yacono. And then the, the uh, new college program is for people that have had wonderfully uh, accomplished their careers, but they're in middle age, never had a chance to go to college, uh, like women that marry, have a family, and then want a degree. So they come back into new college, and that's about one third of our enrollment of all things. And it's very successful, and that's run by a wonderful lady called Susan Gunn. And these are, these are uh, nationally known uh, fields of uh, education. And then, of course, we send students abroad to study. Scotland, Spain, France, uh, Japan, hopefully, and South Korea. So in 34 years, you've seen quite a few changes at St. Edward's University. Yes, incredible. <laughs> Uh, we, it's kind of rags to riches. That school started very poor, and it was in the hands of, of, the, of the priests for a number of years. Well, we started in 1885. That was in corporation. Started really as a high school and then developed into a university level. But uh, over the years, <clears throat> well, under uh, Patricia Hayes and, and certainly Dr. Martin, uh, we have increased the enrollment and, and the buildings and, and the endowment. You know, uh, Dr. Martin is, is a, a wonderful, he has a vision, a, a world vision, and he's able to bring in the, the resources we need to put these uh, programs in. And it's always for the sake of the student, always the improvement of student life. Uh, the new college is middle-aged students have to attend classes on campus, or is, are there any online opportunities? Yes, and on top of that, they get credit for their expertise. I, I do the portfolio, I review the portfolios of all the musicians. There are people getting degrees from St. Edward's that run their own recording studios, <laughs> have been prominent in the entertainment field, and, and uh, uh, professional people who have made a living in the arts, and, <laughs> but don't have a degree. I worked for many years with Renata Sanford, who was a uh, choreographer and dancer. We worked together for 13 years on musicals for the theater department. <laughs> and on one occasion she said, um, you know, I don't have a degree, but I was dancing on Broadway with Ben Vereen when I was 19 years old. I, I didn't have time to go to college. But lo and behold, now St. Edward's offers degrees to actors, actresses, and dancers from the Houston Ballet and the Austin Ballet, they can take, the, their expertise counts for credit, and then they take intellectual <laughs> credit uh, either online or on campus uh, during the summer. But most of the people I've worked with, I'm in admiration of because they, they are superb. They're experts in their fields, and we give them college credit for what they have accomplished in their life and in their, uh, their work. Have you ever offered a, a degree strictly from a portfolio? Uh, yeah, it amounts to that, yes. They do take um, certain courses. How, how do you get into the program? How do you run the program? How do you accomplish the uh, results? You've got to come up with, with proof that you are an expert in your field. And then uh, just recently, a, a friend of mine graduated middle-aged lady and uh, a fellow Rotarian. I've been a Rotarian for 23 years and I'm the music director for the, the Rotary Club. And I have to go to a meeting every, every week and the Rotary Club is, of course, like Holy Cross, a service organization and we're wiping out polio with Bill Gates and his wonderful wife. In addition to the uh, MBA program and the theater and arts of St. Edward's University. St. Edward's also has a very fine athletic department. Yes, and for years, and that goes along with the Holy Cross uh, idea of developing the whole person. And for 27, 26 years out of 27, Brother Emmett Strohmeyer was the coach of our tennis team. And he would send 
national champions to the to the last match, <laughs> and then they would come come home with championships twenty six years in a row. That was his life <laughs> on top of being an excellent player brother. That's amazing. <laughs> and we have the very fine basketball, baseball, uh, tennis, of course, and golf. And these are these are very good players. And then on the side. We have soccer, men and women soccer, and uh, and they, they play in a league. And then my friends from my brother Mueller and his uh, brothers, they're all rugby players. That's that's not officially a uh, sport uh, sponsored by the university. So lo and behold, they uh, take care of the coach. <laughs> they give him a stipend, and and on their own, uh, they get their uniforms donated and that sort of thing. And lacrosse is also a uh, it's a club, but uh, this this keeps the the people in, in good physical shape. And we also have a kinesiology uh, degree, which is like sports medicine. These people are prepared. Uh, they're not only athletes, but they are prepared to take care of um, teams, different teams for injuries and uh, and training. Mm -hmm. And and it's all scientific. It's it's gotten very technical and uh, they can get a, a degree in that and then go on to the profession in sports, uh, you know, professional sports. So we do offer a music minor and we're working on a music major. We have an orchestra, we have two jazz bands, we have three choirs, we have uh, instruction in, in reeds and brass, piano and guitar, and voice, of course, we have an opera singer is our coach for, for our boys. Brother Gerald, can you tell us how St. Edward's University got its name? Yes, it was founded by Father Edward Soren, and Edward the Confessor was the great saint of England who, when he died, the Norman Conquest came and the rest is history. And, and of course, Father Soren came down in uh, the 1870s and stood under the Soren Oak, which is 500 years old, and uh, accepted the farm of Mary Doyle in the name of the community of Holy Cross. And, and the, he named the university after his patron, his patron saint, Edward the Confessor of England. Notre Dame is named after Our Lady of the Lake, the Blessed Mother Mary, and that's where there's a golden uh, statue on the top of the Golden Dome, which is the great hallmark of Notre Dame. Our hallmark is that magnificent main building with that cathedral-like spire, uh, which is, uh, you know, magnificent. And it can be seen 20 miles away. When you're approaching Austin from the south, you can see that. And it's, it's like the cross of Jesus <laughs> redeeming the world on the, on the skyline of, of Austin, Texas. <laughs> and just by the by, people come up from, from Austin to our theater. They, they stand in front of the theater, which overlooks this magnificent view of the city of Austin for uh, 4th of July celebrations, because they can see the fireworks in Silker Park from our stand. And the backdrop of um, Saturday, what is that, uh, Austin City Limits, the, the worldwide uh, TV show on Saturday night, that was filmed the, the original backdrop is what we see every day on the hill uh, overlooking Austin, Texas. Having been there, uh, the, the, the campus is breathtaking. It is. It's a beautiful campus and a and magnificent view of the city. Mm -hmm. Beautiful city. Um, the Soren tree is a central figure on campus. Yes, it's right central next to the figure. main building and that's, that's historically important because that's where Soren took possession of the land. You mentioned earlier that the Brothers of Holy Cross literally own St. Edward's University. The Congregation of Holy Cross owns St. Edward's University. Up until 1946, the priests of Holy Cross ran the university. Okay. In 1946, it was turned over to the brothers, strictly. And the brothers took the ball and ran with it and made it what it is today, literally. And of course, we have uh, multitudes of lay people on, on staff as well as administration as well as uh, teaching but because the brothers are getting on in age are retiring and uh, only a few of us now are active 
uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the students and, and actually in the classroom. But I, after 1946, when we had a, a student or a brother president, Brother Edmund Hunt, one of the most brilliant men in our community, uh, he came down from Notre Dame, where he had been a professor, took over the presidency, transformed the place, started buildings. Stephen Walsh comes in uh, with the endowment, redoes the library, and then along comes when his term is over, we elect Patricia Hayes, the first woman ever to be president of our university, and transformed it. She was a builder. She put up the recreation center, redid the main building. Um, incredible woman. Went on to become CEO at a big hospital in town. Uh, a genius. Well, then she's supplanted by George Martin, another genius, who can bring influence hundreds and hundreds of people. And, and make no mistake, Doc, Dr. Martin is a, a world-renowned president of the university. He, he was supposed to go over to Europe last summer and chair a meeting of Catholic presidents at the university. He couldn't go. He got sick. <laughs> so somebody else had to fill in for him. But, you know, he takes no credit for all these things because he's such a quiet man. But he's, he's a world leader in education and, and absolutely devoted to Holy Cross. And that's his forte. God bless him. Brother Gerald, you have authored uh, over a hundred books in your career. I'd like to have you share with us some of the more recent writings that you've done. Well, it all started with Brother Ernest Ryan. When I'm a senior in, uh, at Notre Dame, he came to the uh, house and talked about Dujarie Press, that he needed young writers to help him. He had already uh, kept the press going for 25 years, and I agreed then to be one of his writers. And that resulted in 100 books for children on Lives of the Saints. And then I wrote an extended biography of him for a history conference. And that's this one. And then uh, we collected five of the children's books under one title. It's called Gentle Giants. And it's the life of, these are all biographies of famous people. Uh, see, they, they weren't all saints, but they were heroic people who, uh, in the arts. So that's this one. And th that's online, okay? And then I had the good fortune of flying to Mexico City and meeting the last sister of uh, Miguel Pro, the martyr of Mexico. And uh, she was very gracious. She uh, met with uh, my, the translator, Brother James Weston, and uh, she said, when you finish the manuscript, would you send it to me for correction? Because most of the people who have written about my brother didn't get a lot of the facts straight. And she said, by the way, brother, you are the only writer that ever came to a member of our family to get the, inf the true information of my brother's life and death. This is Father Pro, who was martyred in Mexico. Shot by a firing squad without a trial, uh, doing secret uh, work for the Holy, for the priest, as a priest for the church. Caught, uh, betrayed, and shot, and uh, miracles now worked at his, his shrine. When the manuscript was finished, I sent it to her. It was read to her, translated, and she said, this is the only factual account of my brother's life. Within one year after I got that letter, I got another letter from her husband saying, I regret to inform you that Anna Maria died of a heart attack. And that was the last I ever heard of that family. They moved, and uh, the rest is history. I was a dear friend of Brother Daniel Lynch, and he's our first environmentalist. And so as a tribute to him, I wrote this book, <laughs> and I make all of my Cultural Foundation students read it, much to their disgust, because they keep saying, well, this is supposed to be a, his a music history class. What are you making us read that thing for? <laughs> and I said, because he taught here for 42 years. He's an environmentalist, and I wrote it, so you'll read it. <laughs> you want to pass this course? You do what I say. <laughs> And then I had the good fortune of meeting a fellow North Dakota one, Jack Davis, Father Jack Davis. He's been down in Chimbote 
Peru for 33 years with Sister Peggy, feeding the poor, <laughs> spiritually and, and physically and mentally, <laughs> and, and I wrote a book about him, because nobody else would. <laughs> and that, that's the most recent, and after that I said, I ain't going to write anymore, this is over. <laughs> it takes too much energy. And lastly, we have to celebrate Brother Andre. Brother Andre Bassett is the only canonized Holy Cross member, and he happens to be a brother. And the irony of this wonderful man's life was he could scarcely read or write, yet the charism of Holy Cross is education. <laughs> and so all he could do was watch the door of this uh, institution in Montreal, collect pennies and dimes, and he builds the biggest church honoring St. Joseph in the world. It's called the Oratory of St. Joseph. It sits on Mount Royal in Montreal, and he is the miracle man of Montreal. And, and I owe him a debt of three miracles. When the, the main building at St. Edward's University was being re renovated under Patricia Hayes, our beloved president, uh, I went in <laughs> to get what was available. I needed some Venetian blinds for the carriage house. I got a, myself a, an empty can, fell over, broke both arms. One healed properly, the other didn't. And I'm a pianist, so I need these two hands. <laughs> this, this little fellow did not heal for one year. So Brother Geraldine has said, let us make a novena to Brother Andre and see what happens. So I, I go to the doctor and, and he has taken x-rays before and then he takes an x-ray on, on the day, the, on the ninth day of the novena and he comes back and he says, brother, we will stop the examination. Well, why? We were going into surgery the next day, take a bone out of here, put it there. And he said, because I, have, I witnessed a miracle. Uh, the, the healing has started and I can't explain it. After one year of this, the cast being on, and, and then the healing was permanent, and it's just good as new. I owe that to Andre. There were two other occasions that we won't not marry, but I owe, I owe this man a great deal, and he's the only canonized saint among all these hundreds of wonderful people that went before us as Holy Cross religious. So God bless them. The brothers have had a tremendous impact on the lives of uh, politicians in the church and the state, let's face it, uh, in, but in a quiet way. The Holy Cross does not trumpet its triumphs. Mm -hmm. they, they, we are very, <laughs> we, we, we do very good work, but we leave the praise and the glory to other people. But, but our, the, the effectiveness of our work is in the lives of the people that we touch. And we touch them because we educate the heart. We are very close to our students. Our students are just not students, they are family. When you enter Holy Cross, you enter our family. And when you are touched by a Holy Cross person, doesn't matter if it's a priest, a brother, or a sister, you are family. I can walk into any Holy Cross house or institution and feel perfectly at home go straight to the refrigerator and get a, get a piece of bread or a glass of wine. It's there, that's home. Every home, every house in the, in the world is open to Holy Cross people. We are family. And that goes back to Dujare and Moro and God. And Jesus said, I have loved you from all ages. I have held you in my hand. I have called you into being, and I beg you, understand. I have watched you grow and flourish. I have been your helping hands. I will be your friend forever, so please follow my commands. I have died for love to save you. I am yours and you are mine. Take the leap of love and courage. Pierced hands will catch you. You'll be fine. Give up stress and care and sorrow. Look at me. Don't look behind. I am yours and yours forever. I have you always in my mind. In closing, Brother Gerald, um, let me just ask if 
you were given a chance, would you do it all over again? Yes. Yes, I would. It's been a wonderful, wonderful life. And St. Edward's is the icing on the cake of a 61-year career as a teacher. And I'm still in the classroom. I will be in the classroom until I drop off into God's arms. <laughs> well, you've had a marvelous life as a brother of Holy Cross. Congratulations to you and thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.